Tudo bem, pessoal? É, eu resolvi fazer um vídeo retomando um, um tema que eu acho muito interessante e que foi objeto de, uma, de, um, de um simpósio lá no Instituto de Estudos Avançados da USP. É, aconteceu exatamente um ano atrás, em 2019. E é sobre arqueologia primata, a chamada arqueologia primata que é um termo que talvez seja desconhecido para algumas pessoas, né? E é curioso, né? A arqueologia primata, né? Mas ele tem a ver com o fato, com uma certa quebra de, de, de paradigma, né? Com uma certa quebra da, da ideia de que só humanos têm cultura. Então vejam que tema interessante e polêmico, tá? É, na palestra que eu, então, eu, eu traduzi, né? é, a palestra foi em inglês, é, tá, o vídeo está disponível no site do IA e, e eu resolvi traduzir a minha palestra, né? não, não ia dar para traduzir a palestra de todos os colegas, inclusive a parte de perguntas também eu acabei cortando porque senão era muito trabalho e uh, de qualquer maneira está a palestra disponível, que é o que eu vou apresentar daqui a pouquinho aqui no vídeo e eu vou colocar uma, uma bibliografia no final também uh, e quaisquer, quaisquer perguntas que vocês tenham vocês podem mandar lá pro pro e-mail do, do Levoc né do laboratório interdisciplinar de estudos em evolução pesquisa e meio ambiente tá uh, só um, um breve preâmbulo né tem alguns artigos bem recentes falando da questão da arqueologia primata um, aqui estão na bibliografia, mas a ideia básica é, bom, a arqueologia, ela sempre é, é de primatas, certo? Porque nós somos primatas, beleza? Então, seria uma arqueologia de primatas não humanos, tá? Vamos deixar isso claro, tá? Quando a gente fala de arqueologia primata. E isso começou é, com um artigo é, de 2002, se não me engano, do Julio Mercader e ele ele estava trabalhando numa, numa na floresta do Congo e ele começou a encontrar restos né, lítico material lítico um, pedaços de, de, de rocha etc né e e aquilo era associado às atividades de de quebrar uh, castanha dos chimpanzés e eles escavaram esse local e conseguiram algumas amostras de, de carvão, não de, né, não de fogueiras, né, mas provavelmente de queimadas naturais, e conseguiram datar isso em 4 mil anos. E isso causou furor, né, porque no fim das contas era a arqueologia dos chimpanzés. Né? Queria dizer o quê? Que desde 4 mil anos os chimpanzés estavam fazendo aquela atividade de quebrar castanhas, etc. A princípio, essa ideia era de que ah, os chimpanzés são nossa espécie irmã, né? não dá nem para chamar de primos, né? porque a, a proximidade genética é tão grande que a gente pode chamar de espécie irmã. Né? Portanto, né, por serem nossos irmãos, né, eles têm cultura. Aí é que não, porque percebeu-se que os macacos pregos que se, a, cuja linhagem evolutiva se separou na nossa 40 milhões de anos, tá? também tem esses comportamentos culturais né? de, de usar artefatos né? e que são passados de geração para geração. Não é inato, não é uma coisa que, que é genética, não é um comportamento que o bicho sabe, nasce sabendo. Tá? Assim como os famosos macacos do Japão, que que foram observados, no, no começo um macaco né, foi observado lavando uma batata na água salgada e comendo, né, que, que é uma espécie de tempero, né, em vez de comer a batata né, natural, essa macaca, se não me engano era uma fêmea, ela ia até o mar, passava a batata na água salgada e comia. Esse comportamento foi aprendido né, e, e hoje né, todos os macacos daquele grupo fazem isso tá? então foi uma observação né, um famoso laboratório natural né, uma observação que foi feita pelos etólogos né? etólogos são 
é, os profissionais que estudam o comportamento animal, não humano, né? Foi feita pelos etólogos nos anos 50 e foi é, é, observada desde então e como é, isso, isso passou de geração para geração e se espalhou né, na, na comunidade de macacos. Também são aqueles macacos que vocês já devem ter visto em foto que eles entram na, naquelas piscinas de água quente, né, que, que tem a ver com é, atividade vulcânica. Então, no, no inverno, tá aquela neve, caindo neve e os macaquinhos estão dentro da água, como se estivessem na banheira, assim, só com o nariz de fora. São os mesmos macacos, extremamente inteligentes, tá? E aí passou, passou para várias outras observações de comportamento de animais, comportamento que a gente pode chamar de culturalmente transmitido, novamente, é, você precisa nascer naquela comunidade, aprender com os mais velhos e depois você vai passar para as próximas gerações, então isso é considerado cultura tá? e eu vou explicar isso no vídeo, tá? Uh, então, é, isso passou de macacos e primatas, grandes macacos, pequenos macacos, macacos do novo mundo, macacos do velho mundo, e, hoje, e foi percebido em orcas, em baleias orca. Então, tem também um estudo de caso impressionante, é, onde os, os pesquisadores fizeram, tiraram amostras de, de, genéticas das orcas, que não deve ser uma atividade muito fácil, né? mas eles tiraram né, é, amostras de, de de, de sangue das orcas, ah, observaram o comportamento dessas orcas né? ah, e chegaram à conclusão de que ah, vários tipos, não só o comportamento de caça das orcas, como os, os sinais vocais infrassônicos que elas emitem, ou seja, a conversa delas é diferente em diferentes partes do, do, do globo, porque tem as orcas que vivem no, no, no Polo Sul e tem as orcas lá do Polo Norte, né? É, mas são a mesma espécie, tá? só que elas acabam, elas, elas se é, organizam, se articulam em, em comunidades que são chamadas em inglês de pods, P-O-D-S, pods, né? Não tem uma tradução em português, mas vocês podem entender como se fosse uma pequena tribo. Elas só cruzam entre si naquela comunidade, mesmo que as comunidades sejam próximas geograficamente. Né? Elas têm os territórios delas e elas tendem a cruzar mais entre a comunidade. E elas têm essa, essa, essa emissão, essa, vo essa vocalização é diferente entre as comunidades. É como se elas tivessem dialetos ou línguas diferentes. Eu não sei o quão diferente é, não sei estatisticamente, se você poderia entender um, chegar a um fundo comum nessa, nessa linguagem das orcas e, e aí cada, cada pod tem um dialeto, ou se já são líquidos, pode se considerar línguas diferentes, tipo que uma orca de uma comunidade não entenderia a outra, tá? Esse, esse detalhe eu não sei dizer para vocês. Mas ó, o fato é que aquelas orcas que saem da água, entram na praia assim, né? e pegam a foca na praia e depois voltam para o mar, só acontece, aquilo só acontece na Patagônia. Elas aprenderam a fazer aquilo, e aquilo é um comportamento específico, culturalmente transmitido, das focas da Patagônia. As focas lá no, do Ártico não fazem isso. Tá? Elas, fazem, elas têm outros métodos, outros comportamentos de caça diferentes. Né? Então, esse é um dado também muito impressionante, que é recém-publicado. Mas então é isso, é, eu vou passar vocês para o vídeo, se alguém tiver alguma é, pergunta né, pode mandar lá na, na página, no, no e-mail do, do laboratório ou coloque as suas perguntas aqui nos comentários mesmo e a gente pode é, trocar uma ideia sobre isso, tá bom? É, a palestra tem um cunho um pouquinho mais, puxa um pouquinho mais para o aspecto filosófico porque esses, esses estudos de caso e na verdade... A, o cerne de, da, da, da discussão de arqueologia primata foi feita nas outras palestras pelos colegas que estavam apresentando os dados dos macacos pregos lá da, da, da Serra da Capivara. Né? Então, a minha palestra, vocês têm que entender ela dentro de um contexto do, do simpósio. 
tá? É uma palestra completa sobre arqueologia primata. Só que o resto está em inglês, então, se, né, quem, quem entende inglês, é, entra na página do IA e assiste lá, tá bom? Então, vamos passar para o vídeo. Obrigado. Yeah, things, things are becoming complicated. Formerly it was just archaeology. Now we have primate, human primate archaeology and non-human primate archaeology. Yeah, it's not easy. Eh? Well, um, first I would like to thank Eduardo Toni. Uh, I consider uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies as my second home. I spent here uh, One, one year, a sabbatical year, year which was a wonderful time for me. And uh, also, I am uh, I am a big fan of the institute's videos because you will see like this, this symposium will be uh, available. And also, there are several other symposiums that are very interesting and debating the questions about uh, evolution and culture, or uh, humanity and animality. So I, I, I think you should really go to the, the, to the web page and, and see the other talks that are uh, really important. So uh, I will start this presentation talking about uh, a man that uh, was a, way ahead of his time and whose ideas were buried beneath several layers of debris composed mainly by religious assumptions and humanistic self-deception. And this man is French philosopher Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne's essays are delightful to read and full of surprises, especially when you realize you are reading something written by a 17th century nobleman. Montaigne is centuries ahead when he compares the suffering of humans and animals and centuries ahead when he says, When I play with my cat, how do I know that she's not playing with me rather than I with her? So this is 17th century. Uh, this is the idea, oh guy, you have to wait. This is the idea of symmetry several centuries before Bruno Latour. And in my view, much deeper than Latour's ideas because Montaigne talks about symmetry between humans and other animals and not symmetry between humans and others, which comprise both animals and inanimate objects. In my view, when you read the discourse saying that we have to acknowledge symmetry between humans, airplanes, and the hole in the ozone layer, our conscious brain says, cool, cool, that's it. But unconsciously, we put uh, airplanes uh, and cats as the other, because we know airplanes are just machines. The ozone layer is just invisible stuff and cats are just animals, so everything boils down to rhetorics. So I think that Montaigne went much further than Latour. Of course, Montaigne's view about animals uh, were not, was not easily accepted and was criticized by René Descartes, the guy several people love to hate, and we archaeologists owe the coordinate system so dear for plotting our findings but whose ideas about animals as biological machines incapable of reasoning Uh, are famous. Unfortunately, the tendency of, human, of the human brain to seek dichotomies in everything tended to portray Descartes as a kind of monstrous mind, responsible for saying that animals were unable to feel in pain, vivisecting animals and kicking pregnant dogs. These things happened, but it was not his fault. Other guys did that. Uh, we have to be cautious because it's hard to believe such an intelligent person as Descartes, could incur in such a gross error. In fact, Descartes' writings and correspondence shows that his views about animals were somewhat ambiguous. This is important to say. Descartes even have, had a dog called Monsieur Grat and was very affectionate to his dog. So I think he was not a monster, anyway. It is true, though, that Descartes' followers, such as Malebranche, held Curious views about animals. They eat without pleasure, cry without pain, grow without knowing it. They desire nothing, fear nothing, know nothing. 
However, we should be condescendent with Malbranche, who was a Catholic priest, so you can understand. But the question remains, why the hell such intelligent people incur in such a gross error? I believe the explanation is twofold. First, it has to do with the naturalistic explanations of the world that came with the Renaissance, and as an upshot of this, with the advance of humanism. The traditional view of the role that Descartes and late, later philosophers played on the question of the opposition between humans and nature tend to portray him, portray them actually as scholars with a very clear mechanistic view of the world and full of certainties. Like they were right, they were sure of what they were saying. Um, However, recent authors, for instance, Sharp 2011, tend to put this in a very different perspective. Instead of certitude, it is possible to perceive in authors such as Descartes and Spinoza ambivalence and anxiety. Sharp proposes that the early modern view of the world, seeking to explain phenomena without resourcing to supernatural instances, was responsible for a permeable gray zone dangerous no man's land between humans and non-human animals. Anatomy, physiology, behavioral observations, everything pointed to the startling similarities between humans and other animals. This led to the necessity to start building some kind of wall. Hence, the wall was not built because the difference between humans and other animals became clearer. Rather, the wall was built because the difference between humans and a other animals became diffuse. Without a naturalistic view of the world, so before the Renaissance, uh, the, uh, the dangerous gray zone could be avoided by resorting to plain religion. A good example uh, is a diary entry wrote by a Puritan clergyman, Cotton Mather, in uh, 1700. Once he was making water at the wall, that means he was urinating, and a dog came and did the same, the same wall. Right? So he had some, you know, the clergyman thought, what mean and vile things are the children of man? How much do our natural necessities abase us and place us on the same level of the very dogs? He solved this problem by devoting himself to noble and religious thoughts every time he went to fulfill his physiological needs. Philosophers, on the other hand, were seeking for rational arguments, even if they were religious persons, such as the case, case of Descartes and Spinoza. No wonder that their anxiety could not be solved by elevated thoughts while seated in a latrine. The only rational alternative was to build a wall and some trenches just in case. The trenches are many, and as in an old battlefield, we can still see them in the landscape. The older ones are a bit covered with grass and already shallow. The more recent are quite fresh and periodically maintained. The older trenches are humans were created as an image of God, while other animals not. Or only humans have souls. More recently, other trenches were added. Only humans have reasoning. Only humans use tools. Only humans play. Only humans lose. Only humans cry. Only humans work. Only humans are self-aware. Only humans have agency. Only humans have possessed the capacity for symbolism and so on. We can also say that only platypus lay eggs and breastfeed their offspring. Another example of. Now, it's imperative to define humanism for the purposes of this talk. Humanism is not about being a nice person, nor about being devoted to the arts or a student of humanities. Humanism is a creed or a religion, if you will, based on some myth. The foremost is the myth of progress or progressive development of the beings or progressive amelioration of stuff. This notion is so deeply ingrained in our thoughts that we are committing major Freudian slips all the time. 
you turn on the TV and see the progress of the driving or the progress of shaving. Doesn't matter how many times one shows the branching nature of the evolution of all species, our species is still regarded by the majority of people as being a line of monkeys walking towards the right, never towards the left, and being taller and taller, conquering the upright position and the holy grail of symbolism. A brief parenthesis is that we, modern people, are shorter than our Paleolithic ancestors and also have smaller brains. A tennis ball smaller, 200 milliliters smaller. Reasoning shows that progress is a myth. The question is if we can really incorporate this information or if our brains will keep deceiving us. For those interested on the top, topic, I recommend two excellent books, Dave Derenfeld's The Arrogance of Humanism and Gilberto Dupas' The Myth of Progress. Humanism is intimately linked, linked to religion in spite of pretending to be secular. Of course, a humanist can also be an atheist, but the structure of the reasoning is eminently religious. According to British philosopher John Gray, the myth of progress can be traced from the down of Christianity with the idea that mankind would go through a historical process and not cyclical anymore. Uh, for instance, the end of suffering with the advent of the Messiah and that this process would, would be te teleological. Everything would have a final purpose. Such ideas were absent in the major religions until then. During the Middle Ages, in the 12th century, Joaquin de Flora would have reinforced this teleological character of Christianity, proposing the idea of the Trinity as a historical process where humanity would go through three stages, starting from the age of the Father, passing through the age of the Son, ultimately attaining the age of the Spirit a stage where universal fraternity would be the rule until the day of the last judgment. Gray proposes that this idea of phases following three stages had a very strong impact on secular thinking, being perceived in the vision of the evolution of human freedom into the three dialecti dialectical stages of Hegel, in the idea of three stages of society towards Marx communism, and in the three stages towards the perfect society through the positivism proposed by Auguste Comte. I would even dare to add two more examples from archaeology, the three stages of humanity, savagery, barbarism, and civilization proposed by Lewis Henry Morgan, and the three age systems of uh, Christian Thompson, uh, stone, bronze, and iron. So this, uh, we tend to think that uh, uh, we are secular, but a lot of, uh, of, of, of thoughts that is apparently not, not religious is deeply, deeply rooted in religion. This is an, an interesting thing. Progressivism is an optimistic and utopian view in the worst sense of the term, in that it only promotes accommodation based on the belief that everything is under the control, not of any God, but of the human will. This is the vision that an, and that animates the main current political ideological systems from Marxism to neoliberalism. It is perhaps one of the most intriguing features of our society. A pretentiously modern dash technological discourse based on a fundamentally religious ontology of an eminently optimistic nature or what my, we may briefly call a humanist stance. In short, humanism is religion without God. Since there is no vacuum of ideas, something is placed in the altar. This something is either humanity itself or science, which is uh, humanity purified. It's uh, important to note that science is welcome if it does not contradict the basic tenets of humanism. Okay, so that would be... Uh, it's easy to see that humanism and the achievements of the Renaissance are responsible for the Berlin Wall between us and the others. So now it's Berlin Wall. Uh, after Game of Thrones, it would be the wall, the 100 meter tall ice barrier between the good people and the wildlings. 
It protects us from the spiritual death also. It maintains our human accents. Well, the good news for some, or not so good news for others, is that both walls, the real one and the fictitious one, were breached. I will not delve into the discussion of human essence, first because to talk about essences goes against an evolutionary reasoning, and I am an evolutionary dude up to the module, and second because there was a whole seminar about it done here at the Institute of Advanced Studies in 2013, coordinated by Lorenzo Baravalli. The seminar is also available in video at the Institute webpage. Hope you enjoy. I will not talk about archaeology. I will now talk about archaeology and the business monkeys are doing. Monkeys, apes, and several other animals are behaving very badly these days. That's what we can say. They are not what they used to be. They are threatening several assumptions, jumping unceremoniously over the trenches. The talks we attended earlier today made this point uh, very clear. The question being posed is, could there be something like a non-human primate archaeology? Some archaeologists and almost all anthropologists would say no. The negation of the possibility is foremost that archaeology is part of the humanities, more specifically, is part of anthropology, and anthropology, as the name says, is the study, study of humanity. Therefore, archaeology is constrained to study humans. Well, uh, I don't think so. First of all, let's define archaeology. If I say archaeology is the study of past human cultures, I'm mystifying. We do not study past human cultures because they are extinct. To say archaeologists study past human cultures would be the same as to say that paleontologists study dinosaurs. So imagine a dinosaur veterinarian. Dangerous profession, to say the least. Archaeologists study materials, more specifically artifacts or materials that were somehow modified by human action. But is the human action a necessary part of the definition? Not at all. What is necessary is the culturally transmitted behavior that can be inferred from the retrieved materials. This is an important point. So, what archaeology really is, is the study of artifacts and the relationship between them, spatial, chronological relationship, operationalized by the concept of culture. Okay. Some will say, but culture is, the, is a distinctively human characteristic. Is that so? Let's define culture then. The term culture is a point of contention because it is supposedly inside the realm of anthropology. But the awful truth is that culture is so ill-defined inside anthropology that part of the professionals even say that the concept should be discarded. I will illustrate this showing two definitions of culture. The first definition that uh, Eduardo showed uh, by one of the fathers of anthropology, Edward Tyler, says that culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by human as a member of society. Is this a definition? Pause. No. It is a description of several kinds of things that we can call culture. It says that culture is a complex whole without defining it. In the 1950s, two eminent anthropologists, Alfred Kruber and Clyde Kluckholm, found no less than 164 different definitions of culture. They wrote a 219-page monography to do that, and their definition is also not very informative. Culture consists of patterns, explicit and implicit, of and for, behavior acquired and transmitted by symbols, constitute the distinct achievements of human groups, including their embodiments in artifacts. The essential core of culture consists of traditional, it's a, it means historically derived and selected ideas, and especially their attached values, 
Cultural systems may, on the one hand, be considered as products of action, on the other hand, as conditioning elements of further action. This definition has several problems. For instance, uh, is cultural always transmitted by symbols, never by observation or imitation? It is distinct, the distinctive achievement of humans. Why? By some law? So, after more than 60 years, the situation is far from being solved. One of the more recent definitions seems very elucidative of the state of the art. Take that. Culture is a socio historic contingent wave phenomenon immanent in social practice, dimensionalized by semiotic characteristics. Did you get the message? No. Okay, so explain, because I didn't. So. What I can say is that there is no way archaeologists can, or want, or should use culture in the same sense as anthropologists. It's not a question of academic, academic politics, or the limitation of academic fields. It's a question of interest. Anthropology is interested in the here and now, in live people, in functioning societies. Archaeolo archaeologists, on the other hand, are mostly, not always, mostly interested in on the past or the deep expanses of time that connect extinct cultures to ourselves and dead men tell no tales. To be operationally useful, any definition of culture inside the realm of archaeology needs to get rid of stuff we cannot know in advance. If we use the concept of culture to study artifacts, the concept cannot be charged with assumptions such as morals, law, customs, beliefs, or wave phenomena. We use the concept of culture to arrive to conclusions, so we cannot start from the conclusions. Seems obvious, but this confusion between the port of departure and the, part, the point of arrival is pretty common in archaeology. I don't know about the other humanities. I will only say about archaeology. It's also important to note that archaeology is part of anthropology only in the United States. This is, does not hold for the rest of the world. It has to do with the influential figure of Franz Boas, a German anthropologist who is considered a founding father of, of North American uh, anthropology. In Boas view, archaeology was part of anthropology with a capital A. So there was anthropology with a capital A as a major endeavor together with sociocultural anthropology, physical anthropology, and linguistics. So this was the, the four fields. Uh, Archaeology, therefore, is not sociocultural anthropology, but a sister discipline. Boas did not put any uh, relationship of hi hierarchy between them. It was just four things you should study to understand humanity, so anthropology with a capital A. What happened is that there was a conflation between one of them, that is sociocultural anthropology, and the anthropology with capital A. That's a major confusion people, people make. Um, hence, what sociocultural anthropologists have to say about culture, cultural traits, etc., is related to their interests and their business. Okay? In other parts of the world, archaeology is either in its own separate department, uh, in England this is common, or together with quaternary geology or with arts, or within language departments. This is because archaeology is such an interdisciplinary enterprise. So, what is culture from an archaeologist's point of view? Of course, I will give you a definition I consider useful, and it's a bare-bone definition because it has to be operational. Culture is learned and shared behavior. Nothing more, nothing less. This definition is sufficient to separate the innate behavior from cultural, learned behavior, and also sufficient to separate mental and behavioral idiosyncrasies, like individual person aspects from the cultural norms shared by the whole group. We scared to note that this sharing does not necessarily stand to the whole group. You, you, you have a share of ideas that can be uh, gender-related or age-related, that's it, but that's okay. 
A lot of people share. It's not some weirdness of yourself. That's the idea. Uh, I start from the assumption that there is no way to learn and share some behavior without some brain process. You cannot learn or share some behavior if the, if the other doesn't have a brain process. Okay. Uh, which implies that any organism that learns, teaches, and shares behaviors does so through what we commonly call ideas. You can give another name, like, oh, I cannot say animals have ideas. Well, they give another name, but it's a brain process, and the name is idea. If the definition seems to be very concise, it is because it may break the tradition inaugurated by Tyler's original definition, followed later by the hundreds of versions compiled by Kruber and Klugholm, but a closer look shows that it leaves none of the classic aspects such as symbolism, myths, etc. Since these aspects only enter into the cultural domain and leave the idiosyncratic when they are effectively learned and shared. Arts, morals, laws, customs, knowledge, religion, myths, etc. are all absolutely contained by this definition. The power of this definition lies precisely in the fact that it does not unravel a laundry list of characteristics that culture must possess to be culture, which, as we put it, are actually descriptions, not definitions. What is the advantage of working with a rigorous and apparently dry definition? It helps in the reasoning process. The moment we understand what the foundation of the concept is, we are not lost in a kind of ether, in an entanglement of descriptions that make us think that culture is sometimes a thing, sometimes an idea. Prevents us to think that culture is something that is studied, but at the same time, it's a concept. The definitions of culture in the literature have this confusing feature. They seem to be very complete and inclusive to simplify several phenomenic aspects but they do not establish exactly what we are talking about in conceptual terms. Perhaps it's never too much to remember that culture is a concept. It is in the realm of ideas. It's a concept composed by, of two other concepts, that of behavior and that of ideas. Culture is not a process nor some essence that pervades human societies. It's neither the divine breath nor the object of study. Therefore, we actually cannot study human cultures because for this we have to use the concept of culture. The concept is a tool, not an object of study. Another important implication of this definition is that it is related to the fact that culture does not define us as humans. Culture is a characteristic present in several phylogenetically unrelated animal species what would be expected since it is such an adventurous, advantageous feature from an evolutionary point of view. Initially, studies of non-human culture was mostly focused on chimpanzees, our closest relatives, so Magrill 192, probably following the reasoning that only animals phylogenetically close to humans, such as higher primates, would have cultural capacities. Not that it's higher, it's a biblical heritage that pervades science. There was initially a great deal of resistance to this idea, especially in the human sciences, where the sense of threat to its object of study or academic territory was very uh, harsh. So Holloway Jr., 69, when the first papers about chimpanzee uh, using tools and etc., Certain writings based on primate studies and early hominid evolution are needlessly depriving us of our proper domain. I will argue that it's possible to give the concept of culture, he put the, the comments, no? some force again as something unique to man. So you see, kind of, you know, we are losing territory, guys. Let's fight back. No? It's now known that cultural transmission occurs in a wide variety of animal species, many unrelated to humans. We saw today a lot of infos about capuchin monkeys who got separated from our evolutionary branch 40 million years ago. Is that right? 40 million? 40 million. 
Another strong example of cultural transmission, this time not related to material culture, but to, to linguistics, was initially detected in monkeys of the geno genus Corocebus, or vervet monkeys of Africa, where the monkeys' vocalizations in nature were recorded in different situations over 14 months and then transmitted by the researchers. When the recording of leopard was played, the monkeys ran to the trees. When the eagle was played, they looked at the sky because they are predators. These monkeys were predated by leopards and eagles, etc. And when one of the snake was played, they looked at the ground. It's important to note that while adult monkeys correctly vocalized leopards, eagles, and snakes, young, young monkeys gave, gave leopard alerts to various terrestrial animals, from eagle to various birds, and from snake to snake-like objects, such as branches, etc., and the accuracy of vocalizations increased with age. So they were learning uh, a language. One of the most interesting results of animal language studies is that humans seem to have a different vocal pattern than all other primates and monkeys, but similar to bats, some species of birds, and aquatic mammals. So this is worth reading. The data are indisputably indicative of evolutionary continuity, not only among great apes and humans, but also among all primates and perhaps all mammals. This is talking about artifacts and stuff. However, the situation is quite different when it comes to cognition and cortical influences on vocalization. Here, the vocal flexibility and volitional control that is so often sourced in primates is largely absent while being striking, strikingly clear in humans. Yet, it represents a neurophenomenon that has counterparts in birds, bats, and probably marine mammals as well. This opens a debate as to whether such behaviors would be genetically determined or, or truly cultural. Data from chimpanzees in captivity support the idea of maintaining intra-group learning behaviors, characterizing different cultural traditions between groups. But there are still those who argue that such differences would be genetic or ecological. Uh, recent data using cladistic analysis of the use of tools and genetic information of wild chimpanzees points to a lack of correlation between these factors. Strengthening the cultural model or genetically close chimpanzees exhibited different cultural behavior, even living in the same habitats. What uh, means uh, they have lines of cultural transmission and not a genetically uh, determined behavior. In retrospect, it would be strange, given the 3.8 billion years of evolution of life on Earth, and given the evolutionary advantageous, advantageous characteristics of cultural transmission, that a single species, by chance ours, would eventually be the only one to develop extra genetic information transmission. It's very probable that the capacity for culture, as presented in our definition, does not have homologous characteristics. That is, it does not depend on the phylogenetic proximity of phylogenetic line between uh, humans uh, and other animals, but has developed in an independent way, as well as the linguistic abilities that we saw previously. Of course, the proximity between humans and chimpanzees points to some homology, but this need not always be the case. It is quite possible to understand the capacity for culture as an analogy, just as eyes, which appear in both vertebrates and insects, serve to capture light and wings appearing insects, birds and mammals, which serve to fly. At the same time, the fact that culture does not appear in all living beings is indicative of the non-teleological and non-optimizing characteristic of evolution. Not all animals have to develop cultural transmission because evolution is not like this. There are still those who argue within the last trench that what differentiates the mind of humans from the minds of animals is, in short, the symbolic capacity. Cool. So let's define symbolism. 
using a classic definition, such as that of Ogden and Richards, 1923, we would have three categories to consider. The symbol, uh, the thoughts or reference, and the referent. The authors put these three categories into a triangle, but actually it's a line because uh, you don't have a, a, a line uh, between symbol and referent. It has to uh, go through the reference or the, the thought. Thus, at the first moment, a sentient being, whom we will call the receiver, perceives a symbol, which can be anything other than the referent. It may be something written, but it may also be something spoken, or a sound, or an icon. In a second moment, the symbol will cause the receiver of the symbol to decode it through the middle thing, the toss. In a third moment, this decoding will make the receiver think about the referent. So, music, Mozart, makes you think about grammar. Uh, so, if symbolism is mentally projecting something into another thing, both of which are not directly related, there is no direct relation between them. For instance, remember someone, mental construction, when listening to a particular music that's a physical stimulus, it's obvious that there is the capacity for symbolic elaboration in other animals. Just observe Rex, the dog, that when he hears the noise of a car engine, gets extremely excited because he associates the noise to Tom, the human, who is arriving. Rex does not see Tom, nor smells Tom, nor hears his voice. The only possible conclusion, unless we appeal to extra sens sensory perception or some uh, god of the gift of God, is that Rex makes a mental image of Tom at the sound of the engine. The auditory stimulus, which has absolutely no physical relation to Tom as a person, is only the displacement of sound waves produced by the controlled explosion of fuel moving the pistons of the engine. This causes Rex to think about the presence of the human. This is a symbolic association. We can speak in, about degrees of symbolism or abstraction, but not in presence, absence. The presence of symbolism, something that would define us as humans. It's interesting that when it comes to dogs, we give the name conditional behavior. But when it comes to humans, the same phenomenon is called the remembrance. This is not conditional behavior because Rex was not inside a lab. Rex made this association for his own, his own will. He learned that association. And he has to have some mental, some brain process to think about Tom. Another important implication that must be taken into account by proponents of the idea of humanity equals symbolism is the so-called symbolic revolution a sudden appearance of the symbolic capacity that would have occurred only about 120,000 years ago, visible in the archaeological record mainly by the proliferation of art and which would have spread from Africa in an extremely fast way to the rest of humanity. Although I personally do not believe in this model, the fact is that if it's true, we have an interesting situation in which much of the work of European archaeologists would be no more related to the study of humanity, but of primates of the genus Homo, absolutely devoid of the essence of humanity. However, data from other parts of the world do not fit this scenario, especially in Asia. The idea of a symbolic revolution is obviously very closely related to the biblical idea of the divine breath. There is no good explanation why this would happen. From an evolutionary point of view, if we consider any attribute of our species as relevant, that attribute cannot have come from nothing. This is a logical impossibility from a Darwinian point of view. There can be no evolutionary study of a character, however specific and restricted to a species it is, what biologists call 
autopomorphisms, if there is no recognition that this character should already be present in an earlier form. If human cognition is an uh, autopomorphism, it must necessarily be present in some state in the ancestral forms. To deny this is to deny that there may be any evolutionary study of human cognition. And in that case, we would enter the, into the metaphysical religious ex explanations uh, like Henri Bergson. In sum, with regard to the question of the attribution of culture, intentionality and agency to animals, we share with Dennett, 1983, the view that it's more productive to assume that such characteristics exist than to revolve around sterile behavioral descriptions which hinder the formulation of hypotheses and experiments. Such a statement, which was fe feasible back in 1983, is even more defensible today, given the wide range of data obtained by ethology in the last decades. The only certain thing we know about the mental capacity of other animals is that we are truly ignorant of them. That's a trap we usually put ourselves in. It's far too easy to perceive animal cognition as being part of a ladder that reaches our cognitive superpowers. However, try to imagine what it is to see the world through sound, like bats do. Or recognize your family by infrasonic waves inside the water, as whales do. Or have the sense of smell of a dog, seeing the dark like a cat. Look, looking at our sis, sister species, chimpanzees, are they sort of cognitively lacking something? Of course, it makes no sense from an evolutionary point of view. Which cognition is more evolved? We know the question is silly. However, we still tend to see other animals as lacking something. If we have time, I will show you in the end uh, a sh short video about this. So, if archaeology is the study of artifacts by means of the concept of culture, and if artifacts are made or used by other creatures, archaeology is absolutely okay to deal with that. Archaeology already saw its horizons expanding regarding chronology, for instance, being devoted to study of garbage left by modern societies, or the study of artifacts used and made by contemporary communities. The interests of the discipline run across gender studies, feminist studies, queer studies, and so on. To expand to other animals is a very small step, or not. Now we make full circle and we go back to philosophy. When I talked about Montaigne, I did not mention the fact that in one of his famous essays, Apology for, of Raymond Sebon, the same essay he mentions his cat, Montaigne talks about similarities and dissimilarities about humans and other animals. In one passage he wrote, this by the same vanity of imagination that he equals himself to God, attributes to himself divine qualities, withdraws and separates himself from the crowd of other creatures, cuts out the shares of the animals, his fellows and companions. At the past, it seems a critique to Descartes, but Descartes was later than him. Uh, how does he know, by the strength of his understanding, the secret and internal motions of animals? For Montaigne, animals were fellows and companions. In another essay, Montaigne says that animals have the same capacity for excellence as humans. The difference between some humans and some animals being smaller than the difference between humans themselves. Of course, this is a very uh, uh, dangerous assumption. Descartes does not, arguing that there was an insurmountable gap. Spinoza, on the other hand, was not so sure. For Spinoza, there are only differences of degree between humans, animals, machines, and rocks against some centuries before Bruno Latour. According to Sharp, 2011, for Spinoza, there is no ontological chasm between what has a mind and what does not. The foundations of reason exist as much in rocks, salamanders, and computers as they do in those beings we call human. Moreover, Spinoza notes the differences in nature between a human and a horse, but also between a drunk and a philosopher. What to say about a drunk philosopher? I don't know. So, in this particular aspect, Spinoza was closer to Montaigne than to Descartes. At the same time, 
And as we saw, exactly because of this perceived dangerous proximity, Spinoza was, was a severe critic of any compassion towards animals. Descartes gave his solution. There is an insurmountable gap. Okay. Spinoza was like, but they are so close. No? Uh, he despairs at the satirists who disdain men and admire the brutes, rather than helping their fellow men and joining forces against the dangers which threaten on all sides. So here we see how Spinoza's fears are so modern, or how our modern fears are so old. If we concede culture to other animals, there is the danger of animalizing ourselves. In what kinds of monstrosities humanity can incur if we lose this divine touch, this cultural vanish? The answer to me is that we lose nothing. From Spinoza's time to now, we built atomic weapons, killed millions of people under the more diverse ideological banners and continue to think we are special. I see no reason why the acknowledgement that we are just another species would make us worse. On the contrary. Do we have time for a brief? Okay, so about cognition. This is a good question. Which cognition is more evolved? Oh, primates are just, you know, they are proxy of our ancestors. Well, they, they are contemporaneous. They are contemporaneous to us. So uh, let's see what happens here. This is a video that, if it works, I'm not sure, shows a... Uh, uh, so this is the same uh, Kyoto, the University of Kyoto sanctuary that it was shown here. And, and this guy here, uh, he sees numbers. And as soon as he touched the first number, all other numbers disappear under these uh, squares. So he has split second to memorize the number. Easy, you know, nine numbers. Got it. Sometimes uh, he mis he's mistaken, but try to do. Go, go ahead. Got it. Oh, it's very easy, you know. A chimp can do it. Let's go, people. Memorize it. Ah, now we have a human. Oh, she's playing with five numbers, okay? Not nine, but it's, it's okay. Oh, fail. Right, let, let's help her. Fail. Go ahead. Only five, five numbers. The chimp gets fail. So what this means? Means that the cognition is different means that you cannot compare a four-wheel drive and a sports car. One is not no better than the other. They are suited for different purposes. Perhaps chimps have this photographic... Oh, and there is a, a nice part here because... I don't know if, if, if he went... He got... Um, he, see, he sees... And, and his attention is to our other side. And you say, ah, he will fail. No! Did you, did you get this? Uh, he, he, he sees the screen and then his attention got... And then he said, ah, he will fail. And no, beep, boop, 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 boop. So, they have a photographic memory. They just look at something and, and take, it, take the picture. So, they probably know where the leopard is or something like this. I don't know, but it's a different cognition. It's not... Well, it's better in this sense, but, but you know... It's different for me. So, um, thank you. And the answer is, of course, archaeology has all everything to do with primatology and should be expanded and we should work together. That's it.